Okay, so uh, my name's Tanner. Uh, for those of you that have ever searched the internet for BitLocker, and you probably have come across something I've done. I've, dealing, I've dealt with it since Windows Vista. I've uh, dealt with MBAM since before it even had the name MBAM. So um, for those of you that were on the pre-tap, it was um, called Malta to begin with. So it's evolved some, it hasn't evolved too much in some aspects, but in, in a lot it has. So I don't like intro slides, so we're just gonna kinda get right into it. Um, TPM chips, I like to have, you know, as much as you all said, yes, you use BitLocker, I like to make sure everybody at least knows what I'm talking about. So TPM, uh, in the beginning, TPM 1.2, it's physical device only. It was disabled by default. And I'm sure every single one of you in here that has deployed it loves the fact that you have to figure out the manufacturing tools to turn it on and make it so the OS can take ownership of it. Yes, no, everybody? <laughs> okay, so now uh, it's still physical, but you can also have virtual TPM, who everybody's played with it yet. So in Windows 10, build 1607 and, no, 15 and 11. And later, you can actually have a virtual TPM and a Hyper-V VM. Uh, one of the big things that was coming about was for Server 2016 with uh, you know, Host Guardian Service and Shielded VMs, so we actually have that. Um, VMware does not have one yet. They're in the works of it, so if you're a VMware shop, you know, it's in the future. That's all I know about that part. And now it is enabled by default. So the TCG group makes that part of the specification, so the hardware vendors, if they want to be compliant, they actually have to do it. So, uh, by the way, TPM 2.0 is still pretty much by request from your vendors. So if you're ordering new machines, request it. Okay, so it's not mainstream, mainstream yet. The spec was just ratified last year, kind of middle of the year. Um, so some cool functionality within it, anti-hammering logic's actually the same, so how many of you locked out and you're like, man, it's locked out for 24 hours and I can't get it to undo it? 2.0, it's actually, it forgives every two hours, so you know, you're, it's actually a standard based on no matter what your hardware platform is, no matter what your vendor is. Um, the other thing is, uh, it's main function, actually. Uh, Protect sensitive data. Um, it basically is, better or worse, a dumb chip. You know, now it's a dumb virtual chip too, but you know, it protects private key material. It doesn't just do BitLocker, okay? So if you do virtual smart cards in your environment, if you do fingerprints and things like that, so some vendors will actually store that in your TPM chip. So those of you that want to deploy BitLocker or, and or the, one of those other functionality, don't think you can just clear the TPM randomly because you will stop having the other aspects of it. So I try to warn people, if you're doing virtual smart cards and everything else, clearing a TPM chip is the last thing you want to do. Otherwise, you'll have to redo all of it. Uh, so where we came, so in Windows 7, it was BitLocker only. Windows 8.1, measured boot, virtual smart cards, and BitLocker. Windows 10, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the health att attestation. I can never say that name very well. Um, Microsoft Passport, you know, Windows Hello, Credential Guard, Device Guard, you know, measured boot, virtual smart cards, and BitLocker. So we're adding new and new more functionality within that TPM chip. So, okay. BitLocker, by the way, anybody like the screens? Recovery keys, you know. Okay, so in Windows 10, build 15.11, we add, actually added XTS encryption. Uh, we got rid of Diffuser, for those of you that, you know, Windows 7, you had the X128 with Diffuser, 256 with Diffuser, and then Windows 8, Windows 8.1 came along, and you're like, well, where did that go? Because all my Windows 7 was defaulted to 128 with Diffuser, and now I have a different encryption for Windows 8. Windows 10, we decided we wanted to throw a, you know, another thing at you, and now you have XTS encryption. We were trying to, Diffuser wasn't true standard 
per se. So we're trying to take that away. And then we're like, okay, now we've got another standard. So we kind of expanded it back. So instead of doing that. And for those of you that don't know, you can customize the recovery screen. There was a big request by everybody. Who's done it? Anybody who's seen it? Cool. I did it for my demo, so we'll actually get to see it. Um, it protects data at rest. A lot of people think that it will protect you from attackers, hackers, and everything else. Real time, it won't. It is data at rest. Your computer's off. Your hard drive gets pulled. So, um, and MBAM with MBAM, you can only have three protectors. So a lot of things you'll see on the internet says you can have smart card and all that kind of stuff for the OS drive. You can, you just can't boot from a smart card. You can put the protectors on it all day long, but during the boot process, you get TPM, TPM plus pin, and password. So that's what MBAM supports. Without it, you can actually have smart card. Who's, uh, who's seen the Active Directory groups and users? And Has anybody done that one? Okay, I'll explain that one just a little bit because that one's actually probably the coolest thing I, I like. Windows 8 and later, you can do Active Directory SIDS as a protector on removable drives and or fixed drives. So let's say I have a, my presenter mouse was an actually a USB drive. Um, I can protect it with like domain admins. So only domain admins can actually access the data on here. I don't even have to have a password. So I can plug it in as long as I'm a domain admin, it will unlock it. I can also do that for a group of computers. So it's a really cool functionality that we, we made because we wanted clusters, CSVs and everything else. So we made it so you can do an Active Directory group. Well, I found another use for it. You can, I actually, all my USB keys have my account that has not changed its SID for over seven and a half, eight years now. So I can just unlock it there. I never have to worry about it. And the other thing that's nice about it is if I take that device home and my machine is work group joined because it's my home computer, I can't unlock it without the recovery key. So it gives you a little bit of extra protection. So that way you don't have users just going and typing in a password that they know and taking the media home with them. So, uh, okay. So MBAM 101, I actually like, um, I always call it Microsoft BitLocker Administration and Management, but it's actually monitoring, so I actually have to remind myself, and yes, I've been dealing with it since it started. So what can it do? It, can, it is basically the enforcement arm of BitLocker. It is the one that makes you have to do things. Uh, it ensures that your protectors are correct, and I put a caveat on that one. If you tell users they have to have a TPM, they can have a TPM plus pen and it will not change it. But if you tell users that they have to have a TPM plus pen and they only have TPM, it will change it. It views the TPM plus pen as more protected than just TPM. Now that is not the case with encryption methods. So how many of you in here have deployed like AES-128 with MBAM and then you get a whole bunch of non-compliance because you're like, oh wait, we need to do 256. How many? Yeah, so some of you guys. It will not go and decrypt, uh, you know what, I'm getting ahead of myself, so never mind. <laughs> uh, it backs up the recovery key, so as long as I have the agent and a working MBAM infrastructure, it will back up the recovery key every time it checks in. That is why it's very, very important to make sure you have SSL, because otherwise you're sending the recovery key in plain text, pretty much, a little, but. And it gives compliance status. What it can't do, and I, I, I like to call this out because these are the three biggest things that I see and people ask me about all the time. It cannot force a user to change a pin at X number of days. Who would like to see that? See, that's not very many people, actually. <laughs> um, forced to change the recovery key on X number of days. I will say there's a, is anybody in here from the product group? <laughs> it is recorded, so they're gonna hear this anyways, but oh well. Uh, if you go look at the SQL database, and I'll show you, there's a disclosed key. If you update that on all your machines in that database to a one from a zero, 
all your machines, when they check in, guess what they'll do? They'll change their recovery key. So you can automate that as a SQL job. Um, oops, I said that. Uh, it will not decrypt your drive. So for those of you that had that AES 128 to 256 problem, it won't decrypt it. But here's the cool part. If you decrypt the drive, so let's say I have a log on script that runs as local system, says, hey, I'm gonna decrypt the drive because you're the wrong encryption method. Um, MBAM, whenever it checks in, is gonna, oh wait, you're not encrypted. I'm gonna re-encrypt you. So you don't have to write a script to re-encrypt it. You just have to write a script to decrypt it. So, okay. So my next slide's got one bullet on it. I'm gonna warn you, okay? The future. We have, oh actually it's got more than one, Never mind. Uh, hot fixes. There is a hot fix and it was released this week, two days ago. It does support XTS encryption now. How many of you were waiting on that? Okay, yeah, I, it was the, one of the biggest things, but I'm gonna tell you some flaws with that. It is client side only. It will escrow, you know, it will escrow enactment, everything will work. You have to have the same encryption strength for OS and data drives, because in Windows 10, later, we actually split it so you can do recovery keys. I mean, removal media is as X encryption and non-removal OS is Y encryption, so that is still has to be the same with MBAM. And the compliance flag will actually be calculated correctly now. The negative. The encryption strength on your reports is going to be blank. They didn't fix that. Um, don't worry, I already put in that request. It has been requested. So, what to expect long term, this is my one bullet item. I actually created an email alias. This email alias, the PMs don't know it yet, but they're gonna be on it. <laughs> it's not gonna go just to me. So, uh, there was a feedback that I heard, I don't know if you're in the audience yesterday, uh, right now, but yesterday somebody told me that they would love to see the actual recovery keys in the SQL database encrypted. I think that's a great idea, and I'm actually gonna provide that right back to the product group. So the product group and, and I have had multiple, lots of discussions about this, but MBAM, we're not getting a lot of feature requests. Like, the, you know, there's only a couple of you in here that said, hey, I want the users to be able to change their pin on X number of days. So if there's something that is lacking in the product that you want, email this alias, and I created it, and it's active as of three days ago. blignite2016 at microsoft.com, and the program managers will receive it. I just will keep adding them if they take themselves off of it. <laughs> you know, hey, you gotta make some wins. Huh? Which one? Well, no, I say that because the fact that most of them are fixed. If you do Eufy with secure boot and connected standby with uh, Win 10 logo devices and stuff like that. If you're old devices and you have TPM 1.2 and you're using not secure boot and stuff like that. But by default, we actually disable most of the uh, DMA stuff during the boot process anyways for Thunderbolt and stuff like that. The question was, for those of you that didn't hear, is how about fixing all the DMA attacks? Yes, I get that question way too much. Huh? They actually presented it yesterday on particular stuff that was still there. Who presented it? Yeah. Who? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll address it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love my little setup of MBAM logo. You know, I kind of, I don't know. I just like the picture. Uh, I had to stop on it. Two server setup. That's what we recommend. It will hold up to 500,000 devices. How many of you are bigger than that? One. Okay, so two servers would work. Uh, obviously, it doesn't account for geolocales, doesn't, you know, things like that. So, but we recommend two servers, SSRS and SQL on one. And biggest question I get, can it be shared SQL? Yes. You can share it with something. Just make sure you don't overcommit your SQL. And also understand, if you put a very low tier application on with it, so let's say 100,000 users have access to that SQL server, um, just know you're putting your recovery keys on the same one. So know where you're gonna put it because somebody takes all your recovery keys. Um, 
you'll make the news. <laughs> Hold on. OK. Um, make sure that you have, make sure you do PKI. Make sure you have SSL certs. Even if you buy them from a third party, don't have your own PKI infrastructure, get PKI. In my lab, my demo, I don't. Obviously, I didn't want to set up a sixth server on a uh, single spindle drive. Um, AD users and groups, databases and reports. This is actually the order to install them. Um, you can deploy the client to every single computer you want, and you can even deploy the group policies um, to every single computer you want. But as long as you don't, if you don't have the web portal, then you're never going to do anything. So they won't actually do anything. Okay. Oh wow, that that's why that I found a demo. Okay, who likes PowerShell? Yes. Guess what? I have a, a gift for you all, and this is in the notes. I didn't put this on public. So if you go to GitHub.com forward slash T. Slayton, which is my alias, I have some scripts for you. Um, they're beta scripts. Please provide feedback. Don't bash them too much. I wrote them in a hurry. But they will install MBAM for you. They will install SS, the SQL stuff for you. They will install MBAM YIS server for you, including all the features. And they will create all your users and groups in Active Directory. How cool is that? Everybody happy? So. Um, like I said, I wrote them in a hurry. Please be nice. <laughs> I will make, I, I'm planning on going back and making them prettier and stuff like that, but if there's anything you can recommend, please let me know. Uh, it just so happens, tslayton at microsoft.com is my email address, so you can email me and I'll make changes to it. But it's on GitHub, so I can actually version it. Everybody can get the latest. Okay, client setup. GitHub.com forward slash T Slayton, T S L A Y T O N. And you'll see it, it says there's a folder in there, Ignite 2016. So, and I made it public, so enjoy. There's also another PowerShell script in there, I'll tell you, and I'll show you here in a little bit. But uh, client setup, deploy it via SCCM, MDT, Alteris. Um, I actually had a customer that said they wanted to deploy 10,000 of them by hand. Um, that is obviously the least preferred, <laughs> because I don't know about you, but I don't want to do that job. Um, deploy it via GPO. So in 2.5, we kind of got rid of the whole MSI, but you can do a forward slash extract and grab the MSI out of there and actually go put it in GPO and deploy it via software installation policy if you want. Is it ideal? No, but it's better than touching 10,000 devices manually. So, I have a question because I'm curious. How many of you are bigger than 1,000 users? 5,000, 10,000, 100,000. Okay. Biggest environment I've been in is 1.1 million. They had to have more than one MBAM server, by the way. <laughs> um, but I wasn't there for MBAM, although I did end up fixing theirs. Uh, Client deployment scripts, this is what you all want to know, maybe. Uh, these are around, and I don't like animation, so you, know, you can read ahead if you want, but the Invoke MBAM client deployment PS1, that was something the product group wrote in order to help with, okay, do I have to set these registry keys? Do I have to, you know, the MBAM installation via deployment was, was pretty bad. You know, set these registry keys, then install this, and then take out these registry keys, and, and cross your fingers and stand on one foot at the same time. Um, so they wrote a PowerShell script. It works pretty good. Um, I've used it quite a bit. What you want to do is basically take out the existing enable BitLocker task sequence step later on and put this in in its place. Um, this also will, if you do pre-provisioning, don't. Do this unless you're using the default encryption method. Because pre-provisioning will encrypt that drive 
prior to this script running, so therefore you now have nothing. It's going to stay to the old one. And then who has heard of the save when PE TPM owner auth? Who has had problems with it? Everybody that's raised their hand that's seen it also has problems with it. Yes. Um, this only works if you have MBAM, uh, not MBAM, but when PE take ownership of the TPM key. So if the TPM was already owned, so if I'm reprovisioning a device, it won't work unless you clear it. I said that fast, so um, on purpose. Uh, it's hit or miss. If you were to run regedit on WinPE and actually look, there's a laser pointer, so I'm going to try to, uh, okay, I'm going to fail on the laser pointer. So do you see right there where I have question marks? There should be something called owner auth full there. That is what that script looks for. And then what it does is it mounts the registry hive of the OS you're trying to deploy and puts it in there. That is all it does. But how many of you have looked at the 1607 ADMX templates and tried to find the backup TPM chip to AD? How many? Have you found it? We took it out. Uh, so how many in here thinks the TPM owner auth is very important? Good, it's not. You can clear it, reset it faster than you can actually go do something else. Now, if MBAM does take ownership of it, there's a really cool feature they added that will test to see if the TPM is locked out. And if it's locked out, guess what it will do? It will actually reset the lockout for you. But the owner hash is required for that. So, okay. Okay, who in here wants to know how to troubleshoot this thing? Eh, that's good, at least half of you. Uh, Okay, I got real creative with some customers because of the fact that they wanted to know how can I monitor that my clients are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing and making sure that I don't have problems. Who in here has heard of Windows Event Forwarding? Okay, there is lots of TechNet blogs, articles, third-party blogs. I don't care where you go. Look for a Windows Event Forwarding, and I'm going to... If you download the slides, they'll tell you the events in the notes, but I'll tell you the event IDs you want to monitor for. They're important ones. Event ID 8, 9, 16, and 17. You can have your clients, Windows event forward that to something, and actually then you can have a centralized place to say, I'm going to put SCOM on that box, OMS, um, Splunk, you know, anything like that that can go and parse those, and then I can actually get alerts on it. So it's a, a nice, easy way I came up with that, you know, because obviously you can't go put SCOM agents on 10,000 devices or Splunk agents on 10,000 devices, because I don't think you really want to pay for that license. What was those event numbers? They are 8, 9, 16, and 17. You'll also want 768, 774, 24, 580. Like I said, they're in the notes. The slides are available to you, so you can download them. Um, then the other thing I like to do is, who in here likes AppLocker? Who in here uses AppLocker? So AppLocker's got this really cool functionality for audit mode. So you can turn on audit mode on, my computer just locked up. Nice. Um, audit mode on AppLocker for manage dash BDE. So now I have a trigger that says maybe my administrators are running manage dash BDE and they shouldn't be running manage dash BDE. I'm not gonna block them, they're an admin, they can go undo it if they want. But at least I can alert that somebody is doing it and monitor that somebody's doing it, so, okay? Uh, the events are in the Windows MBAM operational admin. Admin is always errors, operation is always good. So pretty sure most of you hopefully have figured that out by now, that have deployed it. Okay. Uh, can you talk to the database? So here's something, and I learned this uh, let's see, July, actually, because I was trying to remember when I... Um, 
checking and connectivity to the database from the app pool will only error whenever you recycle the app pool. Otherwise, you won't see it in the, the error logs for quite a while. So if you change the recycle on the app pool for MBAM IIS web services to like maybe an hour or two hours, you'll actually be able to alert whenever you actually have database connectivity problems with the SQL Server. So, because right now it's on 24 hours, so it could be three or four hours before you would even know it had a problem. So. Uh, group policies applied, and uh, who in here has seen the problem with 132 encryptable volume? I've seen it. It gets corrupt, and so you have to rebuild it. It's not a fun one, so. Okay. Uh, so as you can see, there's lots of places to look, and who in here is an expert on SQL and SSRS? I'm not. So, so guess what? I wrote a script for you. That's the fourth script that's up there. It is a script that will go and take all those event IDs that I told you. It will, take, it will tell you whether or not you can connect to the web server. It will tell you whether or not you can do all that kind of stuff. And I'm kind of bored with PowerPoints. So let's go demo it. Yay. OK. Who in here can see? I, I try to make it as big as possible for the back, and I hope you guys are OK with that. I thought I'd make my background something nice. <laughs> and by the way, a customer sent me this. That is what happened to their computer whenever the TPL malfunctioned. How cool is that? They asked me to decipher it for it, and I'm like, new motherboard. <laughs> okay, so I wrote some scripts. Here they all are. But this one is the one. So if you do get MBAM client logs, obviously you have to do a log path. You know what? Let me do this first. To get MBAM log directory and see if I can connect. Okay. And yes, this is beta version two because you'll see in just a second why. Oh wait, that's odd. Oh, I do have access. Um, it should have aired. I didn't know my Wi-Fi was on. Um, the status recovery service endpoint and the key recovery service endpoint should have erred because of the fact that I wasn't supposed to be on the network. Um, so, yeah. You know, demos, sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. Ignite, okay. So it runs pretty much everything you need to actually troubleshoot MBAM from the client side. It will tell you, so if you ever to open a Microsoft case, and you send them this, you're probably going to get a faster answer because this will give them all the logs and only related to MBAM. So um, I'm working on actually having CSS work on, like implement part of this. So this is what should have failed. But if you look, I just basically do an HTTP get on the key recovery service endpoint, you know, connectivity, so I can actually see is it responding to something, you know. What's my HTTP response code? So I might get like a 501 access denied or something like that. So these are good ways. But then if you go look right here, I keep my computer off the network a lot on purpose. And this right here will just show you the errors for all your MBAM and BitLocker. <laughs> so if I click on it, how cool is that? Oh, hey, I get claps. Yay. <laughs> um, but like I said, this will give you settings. So this computer has a TPM plus pen. Um, I was going to put them all in a central log, but like I said, this is alpha, so be nice. I wrote this in literally like 20 minutes. Um, so. W my namespace will tell you if you have the encryptable volume namespace problem, so you can just re-register them off if that one errors out. Gives you the TPM status. 
So TPM's present, TPM's ready, auto provisioning's enabled, locked out, yes, no. So this must be ran as administrator because obviously I access TPM, I access the encryptable volume stuff. But this right here will give you everything that you pretty much need to troubleshoot a client. So, um, who wants to see it? I do. Nobody should raise their hand, so I'm, yeah, I, I want to see it. Okay, so like I said, that right there, if you want to decipher that, this query list is all the BitLocker events that you'll ever want. And yes, that took me a while to write and figure out, so. But feel free to download these, provide feedback, use them, you know, use them. I might go, okay. Use them for your internal use, use them for extra, you know, I don't care. Um, there you go. So I'm not going to demo this part, but I am going to show you these, only because of the fact that I already installed MBAM, and I don't need to do it again. I was going to let you guys, I was going to let you guys actually let me do it, but you know, I was hoping I didn't have to. Um, but here's the scripts I wrote, like I said, they're version 0 one, so, but it will actually go and install SQL. I wasn't very good at SQL. I didn't actually, I had to go figure out how to actually do all the little command line switches for them, so. Make a container. Huh? Make a container. Make a container. <laughs> I should put these on an Azure IaaS and just let you go down now. I'm good. No thanks. <laughs> That's more time than I got. Um, okay, so does everybody like those? They're available to you. Feel free to use them. So, okay. Now, who in here has heard of, I'm actually not gonna go back to my slides for the most part. Uh, who in here has heard of a measured boot log? One. Yes, that's awesome. You know why? That's the thing I want to show you that I don't think you guys ever know. So Windows 8 and later, we actually take a measured boot log from the TPM chip every single time you boot your system. Did you know that you guys can decode it? Yeah, I need to fix my Microsoft account, leave me alone. Do you know that you can decode it? And Because how many of you have called support and said, I go into recovery and I need to know what changed? How many? None? Man, okay, well, uh, that is the biggest support call that I, because I talk to CSS guys and they're like, how do we, how do we know what PCR changed and how, we, how do we know that kind of stuff? So um, I'm gonna talk, actually I'm gonna go back to my slides, but I've decided that you guys were slided out for a little while. How many of you uh, have had a whole lot of slides today already? Yeah, some of you. So, um, sorry, I kind of, Still write in. Oh, that's what. Okay. So, awkward silence, but. Backslash ticket. Okay. These are the PCR values that are actually stored in your computer on your TPM chip. So if I were to do this, zero, two, four, and 11. Please no pictures, by the way, of this one, just because it has my recovery key. <laughs> <laughs> just now thought about that. I was like, ooh. Um, so I'm using two, four, seven, and 11. Okay, so the cool part is this is a tool you can download. You have to compile it. We give you the source code for it. We don't actually give you the exe. Um, but it's something that you can actually go look and say, hey, what's my PCR registers? 
We have a very long PDF file that goes with it and XTF, the XPF file. But the coolest part is, is we kind of tell you, um, you're going to get in over your head unless you're a major developer kind of guy. Uh, or like a, how many here are, I hope you're all like at least 90% of you are nerds. <laughs> yeah, I'm a nerd. Uh, I'm okay with it. Uh, so a lot of it will start going way above a lot of people's heads only because of the fact that you're talking hardcore PCR hash values, specification dev level kind of thing. And I don't know how many of you are major developers. So, but there's a cool thing. And I will tell you that these are from my girlfriend's computer because um, she called me up and said, um, my computer's asking for a recovery key and she didn't know why. And um, I was like, huh, I will uh, send me this folder. So you're everybody ready for the, the really cool folder? C colon backslash windows, backslash logs, backslash measured boot. So every time you boot up your computer, that log, there will be a new log. So if I go look at mine, as you can tell, I uh, don't use this computer very much. Um, but it will tell you these. And with this tool, and yes, I will tell you how to get this tool, you can actually decode it. If I can put my period backslash first. Okay. So here. This is why I'm going to say um, be very careful with this because now you're getting into the spec of how this all works. But I will tell you that some of these PCR registers are supposed to change every time, okay? Especially like number 12, things like that. So if your computer is looking and you go figure out that it's going for 0, 2, 4, and 7. Actually, it's 2, 4, 7, 11. Um, if you see that and you see number 2 changing, number 4 changing, and you were to correlate that back with the PDF file that they give you, Like I said, this is that lovely PDF file. Um, but yeah. Okay, right here. So you can actually see the root of trust. There's, it gives you a little more detail. I just wanted the pretty picture um, to show you. I forgot I'm not on a touch screen. So uh, zero through seven, it will tell you it's somewhere on firmware or boot manager. But at least you can go back to this computer and you can decode the last couple of logs because you'll know which one was a good boot and then you'll decode the next one that's the bad boot. And you'll know that like, okay, PCR register four changed. Don't go to the GPO and say, I don't want to measure GP uh, PCR four anymore in your environment. Don't do that, that's just bad but it at least will give you an idea of where to look. And with this PDF file, um, I'm gonna guess 95 plus percent of you can figure out kind of where to go look. Whether it's hardware vendor, whether it's Microsoft themselves because maybe we released a bad patch that decided to trip recovery. Um, we've done two. Um, so we're really good about making sure we pull those really fast. Otherwise, I think we'd have a lot of really angry customers. So, but it gives you an idea. Pretty neat. I'm going to PowerPoint you to death now. Okay. So, TPM 2.0, 201. This is uh, the actual, that's the XML file in Notepad++, so it actually looks a little better. Um, but I will say one thing about that, that file. Uh, I had a case with a specific hardware vendor that kept going into recovery mode 
And one of you in the room, actually, I know you're here, uh, was with me on part of this, that I had to argue with the hardware vendor because they, none of the PCRs were ever changing. What ended up changing is they weren't adhering to the specification of how the separators and everything go. So there's very specific guidance on how the specification works. So if you break the guidance, you break, T, you break BitLocker. And it ended up being that, I'm gonna say this, yeah. CompuTrace on a very specific type of hardware, yeah, and the person that was here just realized I was talking about him. Uh, <laughs> uh, CompuTrace on a very specific model would do a phone home and inject itself into the boot process. So there was no PCRs ever changing, but it would go into recovery mode just randomly. And what ended up happening happen is Myself and a gentleman that uh, helped write the TPM spec for Microsoft for the TCG group had to get on a phone call with their BIOS devs. And these BIOS guys did not like us. They hung up on us. They said us we were wrong, and they literally hung up on us. A um, Couple days later, we got an email saying, hey, we found a problem with this in our BIOS, and we're fixing it. So two, three weeks later, a new BIOS version was released, and it is now fixed. So whenever I say, and this is very important, make sure your BIOS is up to date, especially if you have these model hardware. And that guy's laughing still, so if you find out who's laughing, you'll figure out who it is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, everybody's looking around now. Okay. We are the health attestation. Okay, good. I'm doing good on time. Um, it's a new functionality that we're actually doing that we're trying to actually make it so where we trust the device. We're trying to get it so we have a trust model of the device and not a trust model of the user. So within Windows, Windows 10, we're actually going, and this is, talks about the, you know, the measured boot log and stuff like that, but we're trying to make it so where we trust the device that you're bringing onto the network, and if we don't trust that explicitly, then we're not going to let you on the network. So that kind of stuff. We're going to that model. I'm gonna skip that slide because I meant to mark it as skip. I wanted that in there for you guys to view on download but not talk about. Um, it basically will integrate with MDMs, things like that, and it's basically designed to allow your enterprise to trust my computer. So it knows if, the, if my device has something malicious on it, or it's not right, even if I went into recovery, it will tell me that these PCR values don't work, they don't match, so therefore, I'm gonna go and not trust you, not let you on my network. How cool is that? There's more functionality being added to it. Um, I was on a meeting uh, about a month ago now that with the product group, and they're actually adding quite a bit to it. So, like I said, device health was always assumed before this functionality is coming in. So now we're actually getting to device health. We're basically saying, hey, I want access to this, and we're, we're basically doing a challenge back to the device itself saying, prove to me you are healthy, prove to me you are what you are. So, and here's my proof, it gives you that approval. So, sample use cases, compliance reporting, zero day incident responses, that way you can actually, we can be more adapt to zero days. Um, online enforcement, out of band, that kind of stuff. So, briefly, it's a really cool functionality. It's still infant, but they're working hard to make it even better. And they're making it hard to even tell you what PCR changed and why you went into recovery. Because who would like that? Let's see, uh, three people. We're doing good. <laughs> okay. So I always like to do a lessons learned from the field. I am a field-based person. I travel the world. I talk to lots of different customers. So I always like to let you all hear, you know what I'm seeing and how we fixed it, how we didn't. And yes, I'm still gonna do a demo of the MBAM interface. Just, you gave me an extra 20 minutes by not having to do the other demo. So you got to listen in more PowerPoints. 
Um, so who in here has to do HIPAA compliance? Okay, who in here has MBAM with SCCM integration? Would you like to know that if you don't have a standalone and you were to delete that computer object in uh, SCCM, that you delete all your compliance information for that computer? And you will not be able to prove six months from now when a computer automatically gets deleted from SCCM that that device was encrypted. Bad, very, very bad thing. So those people have to have MBAM in standalone mode, but they can still do the SCCM integration. And so they can still do all their reporting on the SCCM integrated piece, but they have the standalone infrastructure that does not delete the recovery, the audit and the compliance reporting data. And that way, all, they still do everything in SCCM, still have all their reports and everything else, but they have this other server because they already have to have it for the MBAM server and SSRS with the audit logs, but at least they'll be able to do compliance reporting three months, six months, nine months down the road when they have to because maybe a device was in a locker, it was stolen, and now they're having to figure out, oh man, that computer has been deleted from SCCM and I don't have compliance data. So uh, I was actually at a customer and they actually failed an audit because of it, because the, one of those devices was stolen. So, um, okay, this one is this, the age old added of whenever you install MBAM to servers, you have to register an SPN. So how many people have domain admins install MBAM? Me, I'm a, I did it in my lab. Um, Make sure that you register the SPNs, otherwise you'll get this nice, lovely access denied. But the other thing about it is, who in here knows whenever you do SSL on MBAM, you need to do SSL on SSRS? Otherwise you get the, whenever you go click on Enterprise Compliance Report, you get the, I wanna redirect to a non-secure site. Do you wanna hit yes or no? So make sure that you actually put an SSL cert on your SSRS instance. That actually is, the biggest thing I've actually dealt with with customers was that one. Is they're like, why do I get this every time I go to my reports? And then uh, this is that 10,000 client user that I was telling you about. They, uh, they didn't have a mature deployment infrastructure and they were trying to deploy everything with local policy. They didn't know what domain policy very was. I actually looked at their domain policies and they had five. 10,000 devices and they had five group policies. And they were all linked at the root, <laughs> including office policies. I was like, okay, let's, let's fix this. Um, so they were getting, they were, they were, they were shocked because they were getting inconsistent reports. They were like, they had their, uh, their devices, their laptops. They were wondering why they wouldn't ever show in the compliance and we went and looked at their uh, local policy and they had the compliance reporting frequency at 1400. So I divided that out. I was like, so your devices have to be on the network, online, on your laptops for a day and I might get a compliance report from you. And they're like, oh. So we changed it, you know, changed it to 30 minutes and we, you know, they're like, hey, we're getting consistent numbers now. So, and we changed it with domain policy because I didn't want to have to go touch all those devices. So, okay. See, you guys should have opted to see me fail in a demo. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I had a customer, they've emailed me, should I wait for server 2016? Hey, it's out now, um, this week. So should I wait for it to deploy my MBAM infrastructure? No. Does it matter? I mean, yes. Install it wherever you want. Um, who in here thinks that you should not put the self-service portal externally? Wow, cool. Um, you can. It's you know, but just know if you put it externally, make sure and secure it in some manner. Make sure you put IDS. Make sure you monitor those logs. Make sure you. Don't just let some hacker go and take uh, all your recovery keys. So that's what I protect against. That's lovely cybersecurity stuff. Um, 
how to secure the keys in the database, that was actually the biggest, um, I get probably two, three, four emails a month about this one. Um, isolated SQL instance, a lot of people say, hey, I can do SQL TDE encryption and that will protect me. Um, who, know, who, who knows what TDE encryption is? Yeah, it's data at rest. It means I can't move that database file to something else. It doesn't protect you. So make sure and do audit logs on the SQL. Make sure and just monitor, you know. And when should I use a TPM or TPM plus pen? Who in here wants to know this answer? Yeah. Um, okay, I actually wrote a really long story about this one, so I'm gonna read it because I'm not very good at things in my head some days. Okay, and I wrote it like I'm talking to you all, so ready? Our no pen needed story isn't dependent on instant go devices that pass the device encryption HCK test. The only device encryption that has requirements, however, is that you don't have a device like you definitely don't need a pen. Most customers will feel that they have acceptable protection against pre-boot attacks, except of course DMA. We'll talk about that some other time. I do wanna to talk to you after this though. Um, devices Windows 8 certified, has UFI secure boot. Um, the Princeton frozen memory attack can't work here. Just thought I'd let you know that if you do that. Lacks, firm, uh, lacks firewire, please note that Thunder Vicebulls are not susceptible to DMA attacks through the Thunderbolt port. Yes, I'm staring at you. <laughs> um, it's okay, I like challenges, it's good. So, Customers who have lower risk thresholds. Um, there's customers I had that basically said, I don't want anybody to get to my control delete because they'll see my background and it says the company name. And they said, that's not acceptable to me. So they're like, I was like, well, let's do a pin. She, they're like, okay. Um, so um, if you're worried about a network attack, so remember I said BitLocker is supports, actually, you know, I'm gonna, I've been staring at you guys. I'm gonna go give you guys some love. I, I said BitLocker will support against its offline attacks, right? It's data at rest. Well, if I have a pen, I'm protecting against data at rest and you not turning my computer on to be able to brute force it over the network. So if you don't have things like software firewalls, um, you leave your computers way open on the network side, then I can easily take your device I can boot you to a Pixie, uh, DHCP server on my side. You'll get an IP address. I'll know what your IP address is and I can brute force attack you over the network all day long. And it might take me three weeks, might take me four weeks, might take me a month, two months, actually four weeks is a month. And I can still obtain access to your data. So if you're worried about that, I know a couple of you are in here on banks. So if you're worried about that for maybe uh, front, you know, your accounting people that deal with your investments, then put a pin on them. But if not, don't worry about it. So, I know it's not a good answer. It's not, yes, do it, don't do it. Okay. So who in here wants to actually see MBAM? Yeah. Because this is an MBAM session, but I talked about BitLocker because I like BitLocker and MBAM. Okay. So I made this very pretty demo. And I did use uh, evaluation licenses so I could probably work something out if people need to actually see these. Okay. Sorry, I gotta log back in because I'm still one of those people that I make timeouts still happen even though it's just really weird. So, um, I have two Windows 10 devices and I have my SQL server, I have my domain controller, and I have my web server, okay? And I'm gonna mention this only because of the fact that um, how many of you are, have to worry about DR? So whenever you install MBAM, it gives you that thing of export script Click it, because that has all your settings in it, 
And so all you have to do for your DR plan is build a server, make sure you have the prereqs on it, and then run these scripts, and it configures it exactly the way you had it. Check. Done. OK. Um, so let's go to my client. One of these is actually encrypted. One of these is not. So. And by the way, the self-service portal and the web portal does work in Edge. Sorry, that was my edge thing in there for you, you know, for all you guys. Okay, and girls. So the reports, these are simple SSRS reports. So if you got SSRS guys, no, you can't go and modify this and add another report in here. I've looked at the, I, you maybe can, I'm just not smart enough to figure out. I'm not a web developer, so you can probably do it, but I'm not me. Okay. So here's the thing. Okay, see this is where demos don't like me today. Ow. Okay, good. Um, okay, it, it just, so in Edge I don't have the little happy circle that tells me it's doing something. I kept clicking it, it was like not doing anything, so. And these are all on a single spindle, so the speed is not very good. I tried to bump up the RAM, but I only have X number of RAM anyways. So here's what the compliance report looks like. I am 50-50, not very good on my compliance. Here, I can actually, over here, okay. So. Client 01, Client 02. So if I click on Client 02, because it says it's compliant, it will actually go and run the computer compliance report for me. And then if I click this. So here's a big thing that I show it to people and it, they, they say, hey, Tanner, I'm not compliant. I don't know why. So if you were to look at these top right here, it says policy, 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 policy. That's what your policy that's being applied to this system is, okay? If you expand it, this is actually what it is. So if this were to say policy cipher strength 128, and then I see cipher strength down here 256, now I know why, okay, I need to go fix my policy. So the top part, they'll look right here, they won't ever expand it, and they'll be like, hey, it says it's 256 and the encryption's required and it's there, but they don't click the plus sign and look right there. <laughs> yes, I've, you know, hey. Anyways, recovery audit report. This is actually, somebody's trying to get a recovery key. As you can tell, I failed. And then I successfully did it. Uh, there will be two entries for every audit whenever you do the help desk portal because we can give you the package and or the recovery key, the packages that you can put on a USB drive are the recovery key. So we don't distinguish that says, okay, you only got this, we actually can give you both. So if you go look at your audit reports and you're like, every time I go to there from the help desk, it logs it twice, why? It's because of that, so. Drive recovery, and I purposely did this on client 01 because guess what, client 02 is encrypted. So, restart. We're actually gonna demo recovery. Okay, that's going too slow. Reset. Enter the password. I forgot the password because I don't remember it. Actually I do, but you know, hey. So I'm gonna hit if I scroll down, it says escape for recovery key, so I'm gonna hit escape. And if you look, please contact the help desk as at 888-MS-SUPPORT. I don't know if that's a real number, so don't call it. <laughs> I just, I thought about putting MS Ignite, and I was like, well, that's too many characters. I think that's, that's too many characters, too. Um, so, you can change that. That is the only piece you can change. You can't change the top, you can't put your logo on it, but you can put a text for the end users that tells them what to go do. 
So how many people think that's pretty cool? I thought it was pretty cool myself. And since I'm speaking, I guess I'm the only one that matters. No, just, just kidding. OK, so as you can tell, I am an advanced help desk user. There is a difference. The difference is if I'm a help desk user, I have to put in a domain and user ID of a user that is logged onto that device. So if I am a help desk user and I've never, that person, let's say, Ryan, I'm going to pick on you because uh, you're right in the front. So Ryan called me and said, hey, Tanner, I need the help desk, I need the key for this, and this is my device, and Ryan never logged on. It won't give it to an actual help desk user. So, so I'm going to go back over here because my machine turned off because you have a limited amount of time, so I'll shut up this time and actually go do it real quick. Okay, so I'm going to take my key ID 6 f Three seven zero eight three seven, and I'm gonna say that I lost my passphrase. Submit. Okay, now I got to go type in. Sorry, I got to do this fast. Zero zero four five nine eight zero four one one five one two zero nine nine four six six four zero three eight seven four five five one nine one five three seven three zero two three eight seven three seven five eight eight nine nine. Okay. Ten key. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, small things make me happy some days. Okay. So that was me getting a recovery key, and I'm going to say done over here. And I'm going to go over here and look at my reports. And there you go. There's my entry. So, cool. Um, passwords are really hard for this. So now then, if you look over here and notice that I have not been prompted for my BitLocker, everybody notice that? So this one's not encrypted. I purposely left it not encrypted right here. But I, uh, I know a little trick on how to make it stop annoying me, so I did that. I won't disclose that trick because I'll get in trouble. But um, does anybody know that they can actually manually kick off the BitLocker and BAM stuff anytime? So I just go double click this. And this is where we'll see if my demo is going to work, if I actually broke it. There we go. Yes. OK, cool. Huh? So here's the thing, and I'll, I'll, I know why. Uh, because the fact that it's not, so MBAM's client agent service is set up to delay start. OK? So I boot up a computer, and it can wait up to five minutes before I do that. And then I have the delay on top of that, so you're never getting prompted because you're like impatient like me. And so, yes. If you were to go change the service startup from automatic delayed start to automatic, within a minute to two minutes after you boot up that computer, you will get prompted. No matter what, the default is the Correct. Yes, because that no startup delay thing that we did, we kind of got rid of that. Yeah, because I remember when you uh -huh. installed it, when you tested it, it was automatic. Yes. So you, that is exactly why. It is the automatic startup and that delay kicking in that's that's stopping you. So the client UI thing is pretty cool. And I'm going to type in a password. And I'm going to show you an error I will get. I promise I will have an error. Can anybody tell me why? No, it's not a password. I can't encrypt a VM with MBAM because no matter what, it thinks it's a thin provision disk even though I can make it a fixed drive or anything like that. So I have to, on a VM, encrypt with managed BDE, hence why I made another machine already encrypted. So I can not fail like that. OK. So that's what an end user sees. If it's a TPM uh, for a pen, it will ask you just for the pens to the password. And I'm going to show you the policy I can, you can set that will make it so if you just do TPM only, it will encrypt that drive no matter what that person wants. And by the way, 
I'm doing good on time because you guys are about to have questions if you want. Okay. So if I go look here, admin templates, Windows components, m.mbam, operating system drive. This setting right here is possibly the other thing that is causing you to not have that. If this is not set to zero, and if it is set to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that MBAM client UI possibly will not pop up for encryption for one to seven days. Yes. 2.5 SP1 ADMX, this setting right here, if you set it to zero, within five minutes of your computer starting up, you will have an MBAM prompt if you are not encrypted. If you set this to seven, R1, are not configured, it's going to be a little bit longer. So that's, actually I should have put that in my, I, I could have PowerPointed that one for you. <laughs> so um, there's not much to MBAM as far, here, I'll put this back up so you can actually have a good picture of that setting if you want. I noticed people are taking pictures, so. Uh, that is pretty much all I had I mean, I can go more into the interface. It's a basic web interface. It's not you know, fancy. The client won't show you anything unless it has something to do. Um, and I can show you my policies, and you guys have the scripts now. So anybody have questions? Besides the gentleman, I'm going to make stay late no matter what. <laughs> uh, can you go to the mic? Yeah, if you have questions, go to the mic, and I will try to answer them as good as I can. Thank you for your time.